Welcome to the National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics, NCSM, Leadership in Mathematics podcast. NCSM is an organization supporting mathematics education leadership at the school, district, college, university, state, province, and national levels. Its membership constitutes an international force collaborating to achieve excellence in mathematics education. Be sure to visit the NCSM website at ncsmonline.org. Welcome to episode 14. This is the final episode in the series of podcasts recorded at the NCSM 39th Annual Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, March 19 through 21, 2007. This episode is titled Demonstrating and Explaining How a Culturally Based Second Grade Math Curriculum Improved the Math Performance of Diverse Alaskan Students. Jerry Lipka and his team from the University of Alaska Fairbanks demonstrated how they developed a supplemental, culturally-based math curriculum for elementary schools from everyday knowledge. They shared their results and implications of an experimental design study which showed that the culturally-based math curriculum outperformed the curriculum in place at statistically significant levels. Jerry and his team are introduced by Western Regional Director Jim Barda. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Barda. I'm a Western Regional One Director for NCSM. Welcome to this this uh, session this morning. Glad you're here early because when the throngs charge in, it's uh, you're going to be glad that you you got a seat. So again, very very glad you're here. Extremely excited that my friends Jerry, Barbara, Evelyn and colleagues come from the far north to present. I've had an opportunity to follow Jerry's and, and his colleagues' work for a number of years, and it's probably the, the kind of work that gets most cited. My doctoral students I work with, you know, when, when they uh, say, who should I be reading, what should I be following, I always direct them toward the work of this team because to me it's exemplary. Not only does it demonstrate the cultural connection to math education, uh, contextualized over over decades, quite literally, of work with indigenous peoples and indigenous communities, but there's a very strong research base. And those of you that do work in ethnomath, uh, math culture connections, you realize we often get beat up because people say, well, yeah, it sounds nice, it even feels good, but where's where's the proof that any of this works? And, and Jerry and his team continue to demonstrate with really good, solid research that this is a, a route to helping kids achieve who typically are underrepresented and fail to realize their full potential. So without further uh, talk on my part, I'd like to turn it over to, to Jerry and his colleagues. Jerry, thank you okay. and all for coming today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jim, for your words, and uh, thanks to NC, NCSM for inviting us here today. Uh, am I coming across loud enough? So first to introduce, this is Dora Andrew Erke, um, Evelyn Yanez, and Barbara Adams. So <clears throat> today what we'd like to do is to share what we, we, we feel we've been successful. It's really difficult for me to actually say we've been successful, but I think on any measure of criteria that you would use on the student's performance, on the relationships we've developed with the community, on the curriculum we've developed, on any number of different accounts, it just feels strange, but we've been successful. And what we'd like to do today is to share with you what we feel are some of the principles behind our work that maybe you could apply within your own context. We don't expect you to literally take what we've done because it may not be applicable in the one-to-one -one correspondence between what we've done, but the principles behind it may be useful to you. And maybe for some of you it may apply uh, more directly than others. Um, we, we come in uh, with a bit of uh, an assumption that to, to some extent schooling as is, particularly of course in math education, isn't working. And, and that's why we established this long-term relationship between the UPIC uh, 
Eskimo teachers, Yupik Eskimo elders, and, and Yupik communities in southwest Alaska to try to make some changes within schooling as is. There were two throngs to this. One was the denial, the wall, the barrier between anything Yupik Eskimo would not be allowed into the school and to the relatively poor academic performance noted in all the literature uh, for so many decades. So we kind of make this presentation with the conditions as is and the conditions that have been somewhat changed. And we, we use a little hyperbole and expand it a little for the point of making the contrast. So we're, I've been opposed to having a theoretical position, but now I feel we have to have something that speaks to the theory behind what we're doing. And the closest theory for us, I think, is Vygotsky's and adapting some of Vygotsky's notion of zone of proximal development. So what we'd like to do for today is if you just have this conception you know, the zone of proximal development is basically what the child could learn under the conditions of having other more able, more learned folks in the social context, what they could perform and know under those conditions versus what they can do independently. So we use this kind of graphic mathematically as an area. So this concept says, well, this is kind of the zone of proximal development. And then some things happen. And we're going to talk about how the zone of proximal development has been affected by schooling and some of the things that we've done uh, to change that zone of proximal development. Not sure if this will work for me or not. Yeah. So um, before we get into that, we wanted to let you know, and I think Jerry's saying he's a little weary about putting some theory behind it, is kind of where we're from because we are about practice and we are about evidence as well. And so <clears throat> we wanted to let you know um, that we do have results. And I'm just going to show you a brief summary of some of the results. And there's tons more that um, I just can't fit in in the time that we have. Um, but we've been able to use rigorous statistical models using randomized experimental designs now to actually test and see <clears throat> if what we're about to show you and the processes, the products, all this that um, Jerry just started mentioning, working together has made a difference or not. And um, we've done a large year, large scale study, year long study just last year and we're completing all of the analyses on that. And we're able to um, work with 50 different schools in the state of Alaska, 67 teachers, over 800 um, students at the second grade level working with two of our curricula. And what we found is um, using an HLM approach, which is um, hierarchical linear modeling, which uses the students grouped in classrooms, classrooms grouped in schools, a, a little more natural way of analyzing educational data than um, T-tests and COVAs that we've used in the past. And what we found were very strong impact results. And I'll show you a picture of what I mean by impacts. And those are the numbers I have in red. Nice impacts on gain, saying that the kids using our stuff were gaining more on the test than the kids using their standard curriculum. You can see the statistically significant values with the p-values there. And strong effect sizes. So a 0.82 in, in educational statistics is a very nice strong effect size. So here's kind of here's a graphic of what we are actually looking at. We give stu all students pre-tests and post-tests, and then in between that time we have the intervention. So either they're teaching using our supplemental curriculum that's specific for certain math topics, or they're teaching using their standard curriculum. And um, within the 50 schools, we had spiral curricula, exploratory curricula, we had um, basal curricula. So a wide range of what's what exists right now and what people are using right. Right now. If I use the pretest value, the average pretest value is kind of where we're starting off from, and look at the gain, then that control gain shows what students are learning typically using their standard curricula. The treatment gain out on the outside here 
we have in this example an 18% gain. And so what the HLM model actually looks at is the adjusted impact, and that's the value up top. And that's after adjusting for um, student variables like uh, special ed, LEP, things of that sort. In our model and where we work in Alaska, we work predominantly with rural schools and we started in Yupik Eskimo regions. We've branched out from Yupik Eskimo regions into other native regions, but then also always working in the urban regions as well. And part of our reason for doing that is that there's a long-standing academic um, achievement gap that's been well documented for decades with the urban-rural gap. So we wanted to make sure that, sure, students are learning, but are they actually achieving um, higher and more like the urban group than just gaining some? So you'll see the subgroups I have by location are rural and urban districts here, rural and urban schools, and that we saw impacts at those levels as well. And I also have up there the um, specific math topics that were taught in each semester, so the focus of the curriculum in each semester. And what I like about this slide is that you can see the effect sizes for the rural groups are much stronger, even more than a whole standard deviation. So for me, this numerically is showing we are starting to close the gap. Again, pretty good impacts, statistically significant good effect sizes. And what was really amazing to us was the broad-based results that we ended up finding because we are certain that it could work some places but not others. Or maybe it works with this group or these kinds of teachers. And the more we kept looking at the data, the more we kept running it in this rigorous experimental design, um, the more we kept seeing statistically significant results and strong effect sizes. So we had teacher subgroups, novice and experienced, and we saw it doesn't matter what your experience was. Using our curriculum, their students still scored better. Um, math background, despite the math background, didn't matter. Using our curriculum, their students still did better. Different subgroups, we saw it with the males and the females. Um, we saw based on pretest performance, so using that as the idea of background knowledge on that content area, no matter the level of their pretest knowledge, students using our curriculum were still scoring better than they, their control counterparts. Um, and I explained a little bit about the curriculum subgroups earlier, and again, we saw that no matter how they were mixing and matching with their other curricula, they were still seeing an impact um, using ours, our, our curriculum. And where we find ourselves now is if you look at, say, what works clearinghouse, um, looking for their rigorous ideas of what can, what's considered rigorous experimental design and the studies they look for, even in mainstream curriculum, they have very few results, very few um, products, projects that actually have strong results like this. And the Alaska Native or the indigenous communities um, ethno-math type I'm not saying stuff right today. No, but in the ethnomath groups and things. <laughs> um, Bill Demrit and John Towner had looked at over 10,000 studies and found only four that were even close to rigorous. And some of those were even quasi-experimental, which don't even meet the What Works Clearinghouse. So I think, um, like we said, we walk the talk. So this is evidence that what we have is making the difference. Let me just, um, any questions about the data before we move on? I guess I'm wondering if we could get copies of them or if I could. <clears throat> we'll give you the email and then uh, we have uh, a draft paper and we'll be polishing and hopefully publish it. Okay, that would be fine. <clears throat> any other questions about the data? Okay. Then. So where we want to start now is show you that control condition, show you what the um, community, school relationships were like previous to our intervention, and give you a little bit of feel for where things started. <coughs> So as everyone starts to talk, keep that picture in mind of the zone of proximal development and say that's the one for you and I when we went to school. It's some rough area estimate of learning. I'm just going to give you a picture of how um, I'm from Togiak. It's 
a little village around the Bristol Bay region of Alaska, and there's about 900 people in my village. And this is what my aunt uh, shared with me a couple of years ago. She was telling me that um, her she had about seven children, and most of her children went to school in Togiak, and some of them were on honor rolls in high school, and the teachers would tell my Aunt Margaret that her kids were doing good in school. So they all graduated from high school, and there was nothing after high school. Most of them didn't go to college, and so they just stayed in the village. They don't they didn't have jobs. All the schooling that they had had nothing to do with their lives in Togiak. When our kids get out of school, they have no skills to survive in both my culture and the um, Western culture. All the schooling did not help them. And now she has grandchildren, so she's worried about how her grandchildren will end up, but with these modules, I know that <laughs> they will do well. So my aunt wonders if her grandchildren's future will turn out like her children's. You know, she's worried about them. Evelyn Yanez and I are second cousins. My mother came from the Togiak region, and originally I'm from Aleknegik, living in Anchorage right now. Aleknegik is a little village, way smaller than Togiak. It has only about 150 people. And schooling in Aleknegik, I'll um, start off with my father. My late father uh, dropped out of school when he was in the third grade. He knew that it was more important to help families survive. Uh, schooling had no value uh, compared to the Yupik way of life, um, subsisting off the land, caring for the game, um, spiritually adhering to the Yupik values and then commercial fishing where uh, cash economy had arrived was now more important, so he dropped out of um, school. And when I entered school during my time, uh, the Yup Yupik language was not allowed in the classroom. And I entered school knowing only Yupik, so it was very Yupik Eskimo language, so it was very hard for me. But luckily, I had older aunts who had gone through the school, school system and would tell my younger aunt and I what to expect. So upon entering first grade, I was introduced to the fun with Dick and Jane series, the reading series. And I'd hear wrong because my teacher had an accent. I have no clue to this day where she came from, but she'd read, she'd, I guess, model. Um, See Sally run. <laughs> so I heard like ow ow and I wondered why why is Sally running in pain? <laughs> and plus I didn't know what a farm was um, and why they had a dog in their house. Our dogs were um, workhorses used for pulling sleds to gather wood to go hunting to travel to places. And for our people, these people, for our people, we are considered Yupiaks or a Yupik person. Yupik means a real person. So these people in these books were non-real humans or non-real people. And I um, wondered, 
or I was so curious about these non-real people that despite language uh, difficulty, I learned to read, mostly out of curiosity about the non-real people, and it seemed like it was more of a fairy tale, like our traditional Gulliraks, the traditional stories. So I was very curious, and despite all of that, I uh, learned to speak the English language, Guyana. <laughs> yeah. So we were speaking last night as we were planning this, and we were talking more stories than you heard, you know, quite a few. So the slide you see here is like a summary, <clears throat> you know, of how Evelyn and Dora and members of the community feel about schooling. Now again, remember for purposes of talk, we're trying to build a contrast. Not everybody feels this way, but a lot of people we felt the best was indifferent towards schooling. And some people resist it, find it useless, not having meaningful purpose for their lives. Some are angry, and some are more, you know, apathetic towards schooling. And we were thinking that probably in your situations too, the relationship with the community may you may see aspects, is that true? Yes? I'm sure it is for you, Jim. So, <clears throat> when I first arrived in the Bristol Bay area to work together through the University of Alaska Fairbanks and I went to the district office, there was really nothing that reflected the local people in the curriculum, nothing. And really, the attitude that I garnered from the different visits that I made to the different communities and principals is a, a real exclusion. Karen watson Gagio said it really well in an article, you leave the culture at the front door when you enter the school building. So I don't think we're exaggerating to, too much to say these are the conditions as is. Thus, the zone of proximal development has shrunk. So you could tell from what Doris said, you know, she's obviously quite literate and has learned, and you know, so despite that, but we fear for the variety of reasons that we just went through, this zone of proximal development has shrunk considerably. So we got together one day and said, well, what are we gonna do about this? And um, we've really done more than I believe any they're probably so tired of me that <laughs> I'm tired of me, so I'm sure they are. We've been doing this for a long time, I don't know, 25 years, and some of it at the beginning, we were in a teacher ed program, I was the professor, Evelyn was getting her license to become a teacher, and then she became a teacher, then there was a group of us, and the group kind of said, well, what are we going to do? And out of that came the intervention, and I think it really, we first looked at, well, what's Yupik about a Yupik teacher? So we did a series of like ethnographically oriented studies. But the main thing that we did is we invited the elders in. And that's when I think things took off in a major step. And the modules Barbara was talking about <clears throat> are these two. These are the two that were rigorously tested, but all of the others have been tested as well, not at this level of testing. I'm not sure we want to do it quite at this level again. It's, it's just a tremendous amount of work, you know, to collect the data, especially in villages, and it's just very expensive. So this is the culmination of a lot of work, and we'll be talking more about this. But for you, what we try to do today is to abstract out of what we're doing into some sort of principles that, you know, in some ways become too general, but on the other hand, we can relate to. So the first principle we feel is, again, like working with the elders. So we set up like a two-way collaboration. And in this, there's a number of things that we felt are really important. 
We're all in this together. We know that some things aren't working. We know the culture isn't involved in schooling and it's left out. So what's left out? All of the knowledge, wisdom, ways of communicating and learning on the part of the community and the students within the community. And the uh, attitude that we had, we're all together, we're all stakeholders, we have to work together. And, and in some strange way, my philosophy and Henry Alakiak, one of the Yupik elders standing there um, across from me, um, our philosophies were really the same, our attitudes were really the same, although we can't communicate directly to one another. Um, given I'm monolingual English and my Yupik is laughable, Henry's uh, Yupik English is better than my Yupik. Um, so this is at one of our summer institutes, and here we were starting to teach about one of our modules, which is uh, the fish rack module, which is all about the perimeter and area, and including the salmon fishing season and a whole bunch of other things from the cultural point of view. And you'll see later that math also comes from the cultural point of view. But what Henry did here, which was really brilliant, is he used metaphor and poetic language as an educational leader to talk about the roles of each one of the participants at the Summer Institute, and he made the analogy to the fish rack, that each person there is standing as a post. The posts are needed, all posts are needed to support the fish rack, just as each one of them. Of course, we don't, we didn't take that session. <laughs> but that's what Henry said. And Henry played that kind of role. This is really early on, I, I suspect maybe 1991. In the picture up on the left, we have some of the men simply giving them sticks and material, asking them to bundle it and count. And so what they started to do is that they would count individually and come to five and bundle. And then when they came to 20, they wrapped up the group of 20, and it's Uinak, or a complete. So it's a base 20 system with the sub-base five, and it's right there for you to see. And in this module, the Yeg Island module, which is all about numeration, the mathematics of this one is based on base 20. This is a supplemental second grade material. Base 20. There's nothing in here on base 10. So going back to the stuff that Barbara was showing, even on the base 10 stuff that was tested, the treatment kids outperformed the control students, although we didn't teach it. It may have been picked up by their regular teacher anyway, but probably not nearly as much as in the control condition, which is all they taught. So we think that's a wonderful finding. And here we're working together to try to develop curriculum materials. So we start to call this, we figure we need some fancy words, cultural math tools, because it's from the culture, but it is math, but the cultural math may not be the same, and it is not, as Western school math. So we go into this process all together, trying to figure out how can we make the presentation to the students. The guy on the right is a brilliant man. He looks a little older today. That's Frederick George, and he's a star navigator, one of the few left in Alaska who can travel by the night sky. And Bob had just completed that module and just went to press. So that's really, it's all about angles and measuring and lots of cultural information weaved together. You know, I was at your session yesterday, and um, one of the things that I, I believe it was Dora or Evelyn shared yesterday was just she was, we were talking, we were talking about the base twenty. Yes. Was the way in which the language though connected with that? It does. And and I I just really find that so powerful. And I was wondering if if I, I don't remember when you Dora shared that. If you would mind just saying it again, because. I actually told some colleagues who were sitting in this room about how strong that is connected. And, and, the, and the way that Dora explained it yesterday just really resonated with me. And I thought a lot about the children who could perform in grade, in phase 10. 
if, if this is the way that you have come to know the counting in your own language and, and how it might be. No, no. Yeah. Yesterday, Evelyn and I, Evelyn told a Yupik story about a raven um, and its body parts were being um, pinned down by these big rocks that were rolling from the side of a cliff. And what she's referring to, and I mentioned that the Yupik counting system stems from um, counting our appendages. And we usually start, the elder I worked with would count, um, and I'll do it in English. No, no, so do it in Yupik. Oh, do it in both? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And to cross over, Aravi. Aravi is to cross over, she touched here. So it's five plus one. Um Aravi Nilgan, Malru Nilgan, Bingayunilgan, Kulunguyan, or Kulungun Ritah, almost ten. Then she'd clap her hands. Kulun meaning your top half of your body. Top half. And then you she went Kulun at Dauchik, ten plus one, Kulun. Almost 15. And then she'd do this. And that meant 10 plus 5. So then she'd go back. 15 plus 1. Almost. A yuk, almost a person. So you're counting your toes now. And then two claps, your bottom half, top half, yinak means of the person, of the whole person. Now you've become a person. 20. So if I, you know, um, if Evelyn and I stand here together, you know, how much are we? How much? Two persons. Yeah. yeah. And so every kid, and that's why it was interesting, the urban kids, they had no trouble with this because everybody has their body. Mm -hmm. It is a body counting system. So we spent a lot of time going over what Dora just did took us multiple weekends, multiple weekends, just to make sure we understood the counting system and they said it the way, because there was variations and whatnot. And then again, Henry here is drumming. So we started coming up with activities like a light beat would be a one, a little stronger beat would be a five, and a, a clear beat would be the whole person. Then we developed place value charts that corresponded, and it came out of this meeting. It's in the module. Jerry, I also did bead working with my second graders and used the drumming. The small little beats were a certain size bead, and the louder beats were the long beads. So kids also learned counting that way. Here's Henry again, and he's, you could tell he's measuring. He's measuring. Can you see something that he might be doing that's different than Western measuring? He's using body measure. Yeah. What else? Oh, no, that's just so he's comfortable sitting. <laughs> but sure, you know, he's measuring the ground. <laughs> no, I'm just a joker. <laughs> that is a measure, but it's not happening now. Yeah, he's using mixed, mixed units. Perfectly appropriate, right? Do you tell your children to measure with mixed units? I don't think so. You don't say use uh, inches and centimeters at the same time or two different units. And 
Henry's doing that, he's still measuring. And we've seen lots of instances. And, and it took us a while to see the measuring because it was done subtly. They would have an ax and all of a sudden they make a mark. And if you weren't watching, you wouldn't realize that was the unit that was going to be repeated. So you missed it. If you missed it, then you lost. So it really took a while to see this. So a Bishop, Alan Bishop, and um, we added a little, I think, to Bishop, a slightly revised, but it's pretty much the same. Most cultures have ways of measuring, have ways of numerating or counting, or organizing their numbers, build, design, model, locate, and make patterns. So the, the drumming is also patterning. So all of this math, so you know, what does the work that we've just been talking about, the community collaboration, have to do with math? It all has to do with math. What math would you find in your community? I really don't know, but I bet you find something with measuring, estimating, locating, a whole bunch of things. It'll vary. Um, the algebra project is an urban-based project that's using local knowledge you know, it's comparable to what we're doing. And I know there's work in Hawaii that's comparable in New Zealand, Australia. Um, Jim's work in Utah. So well, we think these principles apply. And so the second principle that we feel, and we just showed you some of the slides about that, is we try to connect this knowledge, in this case, to math and schooling. And as Barbara showed you, Hey, it worked. The product and the process is to build these modules, to build something tangible together. So the elders, I mean, it's pretty amazing that these elders say starting in 1987, what year is it now, 2007? 20 years. Those who are still with us continue you know, to come to meetings. And as Evelyn told some folks yesterday, some for multiple years, why are we going to this meeting? And slowly, elders see the results in the print, which they get very proud of. And now students have something to identify with. The elders have things to identify with. So you can see things are starting to change. Hey. The zone of proximal development is starting to expand because some of the things that were barriers have been removed. They've been replaced by things that the kids know and bring to school. So we've opened that door a bit for what uh, Karen watson Gagio said, is leave what you know outside of the school building. We've opened the door, not all the way open, it's open partially, 30 degrees, 15. So maybe one hour's worth, maybe 15. And so it's gotten bigger. Dora's going to do uh, mm -hmm. I got the papers. You got the scissors? Can I have one, Jerry? No. <laughs> so we have a little activity that Dora's going to do to make a point. And <laughs> The five pointed star. We're, we're going to make a pattern for beadworking, yeah, and this is how my mother, um, I observed her make a star. Okay. She didn't teach it like do this first, do this next. She didn't go through the process. I just watched, but I'm going to go through the process with you. And we'll end up with a five-pointed star. Okay. Again, that's used for making uh, beadwork on um, parkas, the patterns on the bottom part of the uh, parkas. Oh, sure. We got lots of paper. Anybody else need paper? Well. Here you go. Here's a bunch. I'll take a few extras. There you go. You got some extras? I'll take a couple extras. I didn't have enough overhead, um, overheads. So what I'm going to have you do is an I'll exaggerate. Usually my mother starts off 
using her um, little finger to make this. So this is approximately four of her, what is this, knuckle fingers. To start off with making this, uh, can you hear me? Well, they're recording on the television. Oh. Where will this put fit? It in this thing here. Oh. Let's put this. This is no good. <laughs> anyway, my mom made this star, and she didn't go through telling me, make a fold now. She just did this and had me watch. So the very first thing, and I'll exaggerate it using bigger paper. So you need to fold your paper exactly in half making sure the fold is down here, and crease the fold with your thumb and finger. So we know that's a nice fold, Ganani, right here. This is the part that's tricky. Um, the next thing she did was why don't you fold your paper this way and make, just so you know where the center is. See how I, remember how I folded? Now fold across this way, make a little mark down at the corner where everything is folded together. Open it. You have that little crease there. Using the little crease, you should have that folded edge right here. Then you fold, you fold over this way. The tricky part is my mother seen um, a triangle right here. You have to move the fold around. It could be up here that visually you will see another triangle here. So you need three equal triangles. So you need to fold and visually see two more. <laughs> That's the hard part. And then Crease this fold. Okay. I th you know what? When my mom does this, everybody stands around. Should we do that? There's not that many people here. Yeah. That way I'll use the proper size too and not the exaggerated size. Yeah, I need scissors. I'll use a maju. Okay. Yeah, she, she gave me hers. So the very first thing I did was to fold it in half and crease the fold. The second thing I did was what? Make sure these two edges are, and then I mark that little center piece, right? That gives me, the center piece allows me to then fold. Let me exaggerate now. I need a marker so you could see. I think they aren't the overhead. I should have brought one. But I have my little fold. I wanted you to see where the center was. Now come Jerry. Here I am. <laughs> so I just want to let you see where the center fold is. 
Now the tricky part is to fold it that way at keeping in mind I'm not pressing yet because I want to make sure what I have here, this triangle, is equal to two triangles here. So I will, I think it is, so I will flatten it. Let me draw you the triangle so you could see. See, here's the, in the triangle. This triangle should equal to two more triangles, which is somewhere here, right? But my mother does this without showing me. <laughs> but I'm showing you because I want you to see that. Yeah. See the um, open parts. The open parts are up here, and I've made a marker for the center. The open parts are still up here. Then I folded over, and again you could look at the fold on there, and then do this. Crease it, so now you visually see three triangles. Yeah. Yeah. Aspect. Very good. So Dora, this, this point does not go over to the edge then. Yeah, it doesn't. Mine doesn't go to the edge. Right. So because you're talking about this triangle. Yeah, should equal to two more. two more. Two more. See this empty space? Right. If you cut this in half, that's two more. Ah. We want this uh -huh. you want them shape to the same? about the same equal amounts. You don't see? Maybe you need to draw. <laughs> You're thinking that there's. Yeah, yeah, and I see that, like, this is a rectangle. For me, I see it as a rectangle. Oh, okay. And then I see the two triangles in it. Yeah. That's how I was seeing it. I don't see it. Ataki. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe that will help. And then the next thing is this fold here I just made. I fold it to the second line and crease it. Yeah, good. Aspect. Fold this over to this line, the first line. Yeah, you got it. And that's why you want the triangles to be equal. Yeah, that's why you wanted the parts equal. Mm -hmm. Then you lift it, turn it upside down. And fold the last one, fold the last one over to the, that one. Then using your scissors, look at both sides, knowing where the edges are at the tops. You could cut your star out with one cut. So to make a bigger star, you cut way up here. To make a medium-sized one down here, to make a smaller one. So the larger the star, the further to the these messy edges. So just cut straight down. Let's cut all the messy edges off. I mean, straight. Yeah. Making a triangle again, right? Yeah, make it yeah, done. <coughs> so you have a triangle. That's yeah. A Does it have to be an isosceles triangle here? Oh. Or not? Yours is. Yeah. Does it have to be? No. No, it doesn't have to be. Uh -uh. If you wanted um, a star that has shorter angles, then you wouldn't cut it that as. Sharper angles. Dora, look how good. <laughs> <laughs> Dora, if you open it, down the aspect. Yay! 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 Well, I got this picture. 
Oh, did that come? I did so well. You did very well. <laughs> the wrong oh, last bit. Done. You didn't cut it at an angle. Oh, okay. Now. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Aspect. And to make it not so, you could make it sharper by cutting the angle. Cutting the angle. Uh, the ditmun further down, a sharper point or a sharper. What's this shape called? Uh huh. Triangle. Yes. Yeah, your triangle make it uh, longer, so it's not as equal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, I cut mine somewhere. Yeah, it's the angle of the cut. Yeah, it's the angle of the cut because I'm. Thank you. Oh. It's the angle of the cut. It's a bit straight. It's a decagon, isn't it? Is that right? Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. So if you fold. You just fold it back, and if you want a sharper angle, then you cut it further that way. But my mom was very particular, but this is pretty perfect. To prove that it's a perfect star, she'd uh, fold it this way, see if there's any edges, snip that off. Open it, go to these two, to make a perfect star because when you cut some of the outer pieces are larger than the inner pieces so she'd snip open it go to the next two just to prove that it's going to be a perfect star what grade school did your mom go to <laughs> third grade or did she have a license to teach math no really but did she no what did she do yeah. and then Yes, thank you. But you made a star. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. so quick, quick, quick question. Anybody besides me have difficulty with learning <laughs> through observation? Oh, sure. Oh, I uh, make believe that zone of proximal development and that when you came to school, this was the major way for you to learn, but you couldn't use your language either. What would happen to your zone of proximal development? It would really shrink. How long would you last? Not long. One day. So we included, is this the new slide? Yep. So we started including these mm -hmm. visual types of ways of learning, as well as pedagogically, into the curriculum. And we believe now the zone of proximal development is maybe a little larger than when we first began. Very nice job. Oh. Placed a red one, it's open somewhere. Okay. So, so, so we showed you some of the ways in which we developed the curriculum from the community, basically on the math side. However, uh, we've gone further and we looked at how do the elders teach us? How do people learn in the community? How can we change and start affecting? Uh, the pedagogical side as well. And so we're going to show you a little video clip. Do we have this slide of what they need to respond to? So what we'd like you to do, I don't know if you have any paper, if not, just do it mentally. As you see the video clip, uh, we believe you'll see that at first the students are off task. Think about, well, why? And then look at the other questions, and we'll come back to the slide, but we'll show the two-minute clip now. You want to 
This is a, a group of children. Whoops. This is a group of children in Manakotic taught by uh, Nancy Sharp, a Yupik teacher. She's teaching in Yupik. The children are kind of in transition from Yupik to English in terms of the whole community. The language is beginning to fade away. Um, she's using the patterns module, which has activities just like you were observing. It's early in the module, and the kids are trying to make a square. Good. Yeah. Dora, you may have to translate. And, and Dora will do some translating. She's asking, what are we going to do? Give it the way the kids are facing. You know, it's to notice. She said, what are we going to do? Kaishun pi chaksta. This has been going on for like five minutes. Is this scene, what are you going to do? Trying to get them to do it, you can go on for five minutes. She said, look, I will not do this, trace this. But I'm trying to make one just like this. I'm first going to fold it. And she shows her fold. Now the students know uh, what they're supposed to do. And they're now engaged. Will look like this or the byproduct. So, just quickly going back to the questions, um, some, why do you think they may have been off task? She told them they were going to make a square, but they were making yeah. halves. Well, because they don't know what that is yet. Yeah. Okay, maybe they don't know what that is. Maybe their language isn't strong enough. She's talking in Yupik. What else? Their kids. Their kids. <laughs> Given what you were watching, what would have been your intervention to get them on task? I would have started. You would have started, like her. Well, that seemed to make all of the difference. You know, we've watched this scene multiple, multiple times. And when she showed them, she, you couldn't hear it, but she says to the videographer, should I model? Should I show them? Mm -hmm. And then at that point, the hats come off, the kids start to focus in, and we've seen this any number of times. We've looked at many, many videos. And so from this, Next slide. We increase the zone of proximal development more because now we try to affect the pedagogy in the classroom. So what we try to do in the modules, a little bit like what Dora was showing you, we include expert apprentice modeling, okay? So the teacher is the expert and the students are not. So this really fits in tightly with Vygotsky. This is kind of where Vygotsky's work came from in Russia when he worked with indigenous people and rural people through Russia. And <clears throat> part of the expert apprentice modeling, we also see joint productive activity. So in that situation, you would see the teacher and the students working in parallel on the same task. Evelyn's way of doing it, which we have on film, you see the expert apprentice modeling, Evelyn showing them how to string smelt, and the kids are watching, and then she watches the kids watching, and then she asked who's ready, and by that she knew which child would be able to do it, and that child began. Now the children are watching Evelyn and that child, and then another child, 
And before you know it, different children are kind of now in the teacher role, and everyone starts to step back, and the kids are all working collaboratively on the same task. This is not in the curriculum as is, but it is in our curriculum. And then, of course, the peer group work is critical. The business of the spatial visual, you just had some experience with that, so it's both a mathematical and a pedagogical approach. We create contextually familiar materials. Uh, we also use stories and an integrated approach. Go ahead. Well, we're finding that they work really well with the curriculum. That's like the nice surprise. We notice it in our early trials. In fact, in the early trials, the urban teachers were outperforming the rural teachers. In the last study, it was the opposite way. So what we're seeing is that all the teachers, all the students, in all the contexts that we've worked in in Alaska, are doing well with this. So somebody at a last conference said to us, well, then it's not culturally based. Well, can it be that things coming from the Yupik culture and then we work them together, they're not necessarily how the elders would do it any longer, right? But can it be that things coming out of the Yupik culture will also work elsewhere, right? Why not? So, and again, the way we build the curriculum, you don't have to teach it only one way. Things are overly stuffed, if you will, and you could work in multiple ways, and the kids have multiple ways. So different teachers will implement it differently. And then, of course, we've changed the communicative norms towards the community norms. And here what's critical is that different communities have different ways of, you know, and when I grew up, you're supposed to everybody speak at the same time, okay? That's how you get the floor, right? In other places, it's one person at a time. So there's different rules for even who is to speak. Johnny, raise your hand, versus a, you, you just speak when you're ready. When I was in Australia working with Pitt and Jajara folks, if the teacher called on any student, because let's say the student just shouted out, oh, last night I did, and the teacher would go, oh, Barbara, what did you do last night? Barbara would drop her head and would not respond. So as I watched the filming, and you know, I was in the classroom, any direct communication was not allowed. Students were not supposed to respond like that. There was an inappropriate way of communicating. And that was the way the teacher was communicating. She was Aboriginal, but not Pitjantjara. So we went over the tape, and we went over what we were seeing, all the Ian Malcolm's work in Australia on social linguistics, and she tried to adapt that. We use the same principles here, and we don't say how Dora did is how you should do it. How you should do it is based on you, and who are you working with in what context. So we open the curriculum up, you know, which is a different principle. Jim? Gary, I was just going to say we have about <coughs> one more minute, unfortunately. Oh, poor Shigen. <laughs> Bob is going to quickly talk about Shigen. We have another video clip, but to save time, she'll explain it. So, so it's also using the Egg Island module. We're talking about grouping and place value. I believe where they were in the module, um, they've gotten to the idea of the counting with the, the 20 fingers and toes. And as the teacher, she decided to supplement. So we work more towards the base 20. She chose to focus more on the base 5. And it's somewhat in the curriculum, but she only experimented on it. So what we see the kids doing, and it's still multiple forms of representation in a whole group setting, is working as encoding and decoding numbers in base 5. So the kids are able to understand, she eventually has them um, adding these numbers together in this five, and they'll have them, the answer 24, this five. And the, the part that is going to say to her, she says, do I have 24 eggs? And the whole time, no. They automatically recognize that 24 is not this town, but they're only 24 eggs. How many do I have? So eventually the student comes up with 14. There's two fives and a four. So to see a secondary class <laughs> in code and decode numbers in base 5 and base 10 was just very really exciting. And that was really all through the work of how it built out of the module. And then the teacher feeling comfortable enough to 
to take that deviation and be strong enough to be able to do that. Tell them a little about her class and the item on the post test. Okay, so she is a cricket teacher from Juno, and her class is cricket, so it's Alaska Native but not Rupik. And um, a second grader has already been identified as basically having troubles with school, and that's why they've been placed in her class, but almost a cricket immersion class. Um, and Oh, and so when we were watching that, that was very exciting, <laughs> and the connection he was asking me about was, on the actual pre and post test for this um, module, we had a very similar item where we have the number 24, and of course we're talking base 10 in, on this test, the number 24 pointing to the number 2 and asking, circle the number of dots that represents this part of the number. So if the kids are able to transfer that information from 2 files, right, and 24 base 5 to 2 times and 24 base 10, then um, they were able to get that right. Across the whole study, that was a very, very difficult concept. That was the most difficult item in the test, and we had, I forget, maybe 15, 20 percent of kids who were able to get that one right. So the connections are very strong. A quick follow up on that. So that was the hardest item on the test. You know, the 24, 2 on the line, you know, meaning that it represents 20 objects. So these kids, again, in the zone of proximal development, with the manipulatives, with the actually familiar situation, with the module, with a really good teacher in Chagrin, were performing. What grade level would kids be doing um, base 5? Doing addition in base 5, being able to, what is the word, encode or, or, or notation, they were actually doing numeric notation in base 5. What grade would be doing this? Any idea? <laughs> How many teachers would be able to do that problem in our workshop, but virtually none? So these second graders were performing within this zone of proximal development with all of the support, social, cognitive, physical, etc., at a fairly high level. And when I told the assistant superintendent about this in that district, she started crying. She was so pleased. Next slide. There we go. So this is our concluding slide. So we feel the very processes and products and ways of working with folks has turned some of this hopelessness into hope. That's Evelyn's words from last night. <laughs> turned purposeless classrooms into learning communities. Turned cultural dissonance into relevance. Turned distrust into a trust. And here I want to emphasize the teachers. The same attitude which we originally started with the elders and working together, we really have in our work with the teachers. If yeah, if we had the answers, we, you know, as my mother would say, we'd be making millions of dollars or whatever. But we don't have the answers, you know, we're plodding along and we keep learning from each other. And that's the principle we work with the teachers, like Shadun, because we have this kind of mutual ownership about what we're doing. We know the conditions as is are not really working sufficiently, that we're really open to how can we improve this. Shadun, has improved upon that's the second grade teacher in Juno on the modules by including those lessons in base five, which end up being a better bridge to the base 20 stuff than originally constructed and written in this module. So the teacher felt free not to follow exactly what's in the module, to make cultural adaptations, communicative adaptations, and mathematical adaptations. We think teachers are better off in that frame of mind than like with everyday math where you need to be on this page, you know, where everybody needs to follow the script in the same way all of the time, or, you know, in some ways like Saxon, where the role of the teacher, and that's a teacher-proof curriculum. We've really gone the opposite way, even though the political pressures are against us, but we're, we're walking the walk. Thank you. This concludes the series of podcasts recorded at the 39th Annual NCSM Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, March 19th through the 21st, 2007. 
The 40th annual NCSM conference will be held in Salt Lake City Monday, April 7th through Wednesday, April 9th, 2008. We hope to bring you more of the major sessions in the coming year.